Hmm. What's with you today, Newland? Still stuck at the police station? Nope, Joe. Today I'm all a tinkle. Today the chief's trusting me with a scoop of the year. I'm going to court. I'm going to cover old Dr. Charlie's trial. Oh. Well, at least you'll get a chance to get some shut eye. Yeah. And I'm going to make a special request to have you do all my rewrites. insurance salesman. Do you know the defendant, Dr. Charles Bisson? No, I do not. Do you know either of the plaintiffs I represent? No, sir. I miss anything, Smitty? Ah, they're still picking the jury. And I mean picking. What is your occupation, Mr. Meek? I'm an exterminator. Bugs. Do you know the defendant, Dr. Charles Grayson? No, sir. Have you, or to your knowledge, has any of your relatives ever been treated at Dr. Grayson's clinic? No, sir. Do you know either of the plaintiffs I represent, Mr. Kent Grayson, Mr. Bert Grayson, nephews of Dr. Grayson? No, sir. Mr. Barstow? Oh. Mr. Carlston. What is your occupation, sir? I'm a chemist. Are you a member of any church? No, sir. Then I assume that you're not what is variously called a tither or a regular giver to a church. No, sir. Oh, Mrs. Burton, I believe I forgot to ask you this before. Do you belong to any church? Yes, sir. Oh, and do you make it a practice to give money to your church? I always give a proportionate share of my income. Thank you, Mrs. Burton. I... That's all. You're excused. I must caution you, Mr. Palmer. You have only one peremptory challenge left. Miss Maxine Spelvana, please step into the jury box. What is your occupation, Miss Spelvana? I'm an editorial writer. Are you a member of any church? No, I'm not. Do you believe in the customary practice of giving to a church? I do not. Don't take it so seriously, Peter. This last one is even worse than the others. Look, so far there are no more than three or four of these jurors who'd be sympathetic to our side. We're not looking for sympathy, Peter. But doctor, antagonistic jurors such as these appear to be could condemn us in five minutes. Don't worry, Peter. It'll be all right. And convincing such a jury will not only vindicate my actions, but also prove the teachings of our Lord. Your turn, Mr. Grover. Your Honor, my client accepts the jury as presently constituted. The jury is satisfactory to both sides? We accept the jury. The jury is satisfactory to us. Swear the jury. Jury, please rise. Solemnly swear that you and each of you will well and truly try the matter in issue between Burton and Kent Grayson, the plaintiff, and Dr. Charles Grayson, the defendant, and a true verdict render according to the evidence I hope you got. I do. You may be seated. You may open to the jury, Mr. Palmer. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most pathetic case. A famous physician, respected and admired by countless people, has proved himself incompetent to manage his affairs. This court has already issued a temporary injunction restraining him from disposing of his property. Now it becomes my painful duty to present evidence that will prove him mentally incompetent and therefore one who should be prevented from impoverishing himself. It may surprise you to know that though I represent the plaintiffs, 
My sympathy is with the defendant. And I feel that you, too, would be likely to be sympathetic. However, may I remind you that this legal action was not brought against the defendant, but for his welfare and protection. And we feel certain the evidence we are about to present will convince you that the defendant's aberrations warrant a verdict for the plaintiffs. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. You may call your first witness, Mr. Palmer. Uh, Mr. Uh, Jeff Norton, please. Mr. Jeff Norton, please take the stand. Let another truth and nothing but the truth, I hope you got it. I do. Mr. Northrup, what are your occupations, sir? I'm a banker. I'm vice president of the Midvale First National. And you know the defendant, Dr. Grayson? Oh, very well. Dr. Grayson's been banking with us for over 40 years. On the 12th of April, Dr. Grayson came to see you at your office. Would you describe the nature of the doctor's visit? Well, he came to make a rather, well, unusual request. Nice to see you, Doctor. Thank you, thank you. Well, what can we do for you? Jess, I'd like to transfer about $10,000 into a special account. Well, that's simple enough. What type of account, Dr. Charlie? An ordinary checking account under the name of Charlie. This is something special, Jess. You see, there are a lot of people in this old world who need a helping hand. We've all sorts of welfare and religious agencies to take care of the needy. I know, but some of the people I mean are usually considered unworthy or ineligible. But Dr. Charlie, don't you think a trained social worker is a better judge as to who's deserving or not? Hmm, that's a debatable question, Jess. But. Be that as it may, I still want to open that special account, if I may. Just under the name of Charlie? Yes. <laughs> and this is the card Dr. Grayson signed that day? Yes, sir, it is. Mr. Northrop, did you form any opinion as to the rationality of Dr. Grayson's request? I object! I'd rather not answer that question, Your Honor. Objection sustained. No witness, Mr. Grover. Mr. Northrup, are you a member of a church? I object. Whether or not the witness is a member of the church is irrelevant. Your Honor, the question may appear irrelevant now, but we intend to show its relevancy later. Then if the court still deems it irrelevant, we will agree that it be stricken from the record. Very well. Proceed, Mr. Grover. Are you a member of a church, Mr. Northrup? Yes, sir. And, uh, do you contribute to your church? Yes, uh, naturally. How, sir? Oh, in various ways. Such as what? Well, I give money. I teach a Bible class. I also act as usher. Oh, I serve on various committees. That's all, Mr. Northrup. Mr. Lewis Lumpkin, please. Mr. Lewis Lumpkin, please take the stand. We're to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so I hope you got it. Yeah, sure. You may sit down, sir. You are Lewis Lumpkin, also known as Louis? Yeah, that's right. What is your occupation, Louis? Well, uh, right now I'm uh, unemployed. Mm -hmm. What do you do when employed? Oh, lots of things. 
According to police records of your conviction, some of your previous occupations have been bookmaking, swindling, shoplifting. I object. Your Honor, if the court pleases, this, this is an adverse witness. Establishing his character is of prime importance. We are seeking to show that a mentally competent individual would not associate with the witness. Objection overruled. Proceed. Louis, will you describe how and when you first met the defendant? Well, it was a couple of months ago. I'm walking across Washington Park. <laughs> Some people. What's the matter, my friend? You seem troubled. Troubled? Now, that's a mild word, brother. A mild word. Me? I... Hello, doctor. How are you? Good morning. Well, well, Louie. When did they let you out? What's that to you? And you can't pinch a guy for just sitting on a park bench, neither. Not if you're only sitting, Louis. You shouldn't let resentment embitter your life, my friend. Hmm. It's easy to see you ain't never had them blue boys on your neck like I have. Did you ever try doing anything once you've been in a hoose now? No. Just because a guy makes one little mistake, one mistake in his lifetime, they never let you live it down. And no matter what I turn to, there's the cops. Always was putting a crimp on me. What is your line of work, Louis? Oh, anything to make a couple of bucks. Only, some days it's... don't even pay to get out of bed. From the little I gather about you, my friend, I surmise you've had more than your share of disappointments. You can say that again. And I got a hunch the worst is yet to come. Would uh, a few dollars help to tide you over? You kidding? Hey, you on a level? Of course, my friend. Why? Well, I understand that there are times and circumstances when a few dollars might change a man's whole outlook on life. You can say that again, too. Hey, Mac, about how much can you spare? Would, uh, fifty dollars be any help? Fifty? Hey, now look, Mac, if you got that kind of dough to toss around... I merely wish to help you get a new lease on life, Louis. Now, the full name is... Lumpkin. L-U-M-P-K-I-N. U-M-P-K-I-N. You, uh, ain't got no cash on you, huh? Oh, don't you worry, Louie. You'll find that check is good. on the bench with a little while ago. What about him? Well, where can I find him? Why? Well, him and me, we're buddies. Oh, are you now? Yeah. And what would a fine citizen like Dr. Charlie be wanting with the Dr. like... Dr. Charlie? You mean, that was old Doc Grayson? From the clinic? Oh, thanks. I'll be seeing you. 
Sit down, please. Doc, this is the Mrs. Dalton I was telling you about. She's got no friends, and her Freddie just died, and she ain't got no dough for his funeral. I'm terribly sorry to hear about your plight, Mrs. Dalton. Tell me, what can I do to help? It's like Louie told you, Doctor. I'm in a bad fix. It's for Freddie. And all together, how much did you receive from Dr. Grayson for Freddie's funeral, Mrs. Dalton? Four hundred dollars. And how much did you give back to Louie? Two hundred. And lastly, Mrs. Dalton, who was Freddie? Please answer the question. Come, come, Miss Dalton, tell the jury. Who was Freddie? Freddie... was... he was my cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but I've got to explain. That'll be all, Miss Dalton. Your witness, Mr. Grover. No questions of the witness at this time. Ms. Mary Biddle, please. Ms. Mary Biddle, please take the stand. Did you know one of your own servants was going to testify against you? I guess Mary didn't approve either. Way to tell the truth or nothing but the truth, I hope you got. I do. Sit down, please. Mrs. Biddle, you and your husband John are employed as housekeepers for Dr. Grayson, is that correct? That's right. You recall Dr. Grayson having a visitor, Reverend William Goodwin, coming to the house in the afternoon of May the 19th? Yes, and this was the third visit the preacher made. Lovely day, isn't it? Yes, it is. Doctor, Mr. Goodwin is here to see you. Oh, fine. Pastor, come in, come in. Thank you, Doctor. I dropped in to talk further with you about that special gift to our church. Oh, sit down, will you? Thank you. convincing talker. Give him time enough and he'll hypnotize the doctor into agreeing to anything. so much, Dr. Grayson. You're most generous. It isn't very often that we're offered a gift of $50,000. Oh, please don't mention it, Thank Pastor. You. I only wish I'd done this a long time ago. Goodbye, Doctor, and God bless you. Goodbye, Pastor. Just imagine it. $50,000. My Dr. Grayson must be... That's all, Mr. Biddle. Your witness, Mr. Grover. No questions of the witness at this time. You may step down, Mr. Biddle. Mr. Richard Gorman, please. Mr. Richard Gorman, please take the stand. 
swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so I hope you God. I do. Mr. Gorman, what is your occupation, please? I'm a licensed private detective. You were hired to check on Dr. Grayson to gather certain evidence? That's right. Mr. Gorman, in your own words, would you describe to the court and jury what you observed? Well, on the very first day I started trailing Dr. Grayson... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, there are times when half-truths are worse than deliberate perjury. I object. The defense counsel has no right in his opening statement to challenge and impeach the character of our witnesses. Let's hear what Mr. Grover has to say. No, ladies and gentlemen. We are not attempting to impeach these witnesses. We will not even attempt to refute the facts they have testified to. But, Your Honor, my opponent has already characterized the testimony as half-truths and perjury. Your remarks are out of order, Mr. Palmer. Proceed, Mr. Grover. Ladies and gentlemen, to enable you to reach a just verdict, we will recall some of these witnesses, and by their own additional testimony, prove that the so-called aberrations of the defendant were in truth the sane impulses of a benevolent and godly man. A man who realized that he never could have reached the pinnacle of success without divine help. A man who came to feel that all of his worldly goods and possessions were not actually his, but God's. Would you please call the Reverend William Goodwin. Reverend William Goodwin, please take a stand. Do I to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Mr. Goodwin, what is your vocation? I'm a minister. Are you well acquainted with Dr. Grayson? I am. Would you tell us, when did you first meet Dr. Grayson? It was almost five years ago, when I became his pastor. Dr. Grayson had already been a member of the church for many years. I object. Anything that might have transpired between the witness and the defendant five years ago is totally irrelevant. Your Honor, is not the motivating factor which inspired my client's actions relevant to the issue? Objection overruled. You may proceed. Now, Mr. Goodwin, as Dr. Grayson's pastor, were you well acquainted with him? Not especially. I didn't come to know the doctor really well until about two years ago when I went to see him at his clinic. Pastor Goodwin is here, Doctor. Oh, Pastor, come in, come in, Dr. Grayson. Won't you sit down? Thank you. Well, what can I do for you? I'm here on behalf of Jimmy Daniels. You know his family are members of our church. The child's had an injury which your staff... But, uh, Pastor, this is a case for our medical staff. While I'm still head of this institution, I'm no longer active as a surgeon. Doctor, this is a matter of life and death. Jimmy's had a brain injury, which your staff claims will leave him an imbecile. He needs an operation, and I understand that you are the only one here who could perform such a delicate operation. But, Pastor, I've been leaving all surgery to our staff. At my age, these old hands are beginning to be clumsy. It may be in your power to save the boy. Won't you try it, Doctor? Please bring me the James Daniels file and ask Dr. Wagnall to step in my office.
You still don't believe you can do the surgery, Dr. Wagner? I'd rather not, Doctor. Then... Will you assist me? Doctor, would you stake your reputation on one impossible operation? Impossible? Who except God can tell what is impossible? Very well, Doctor. I'll assist you. Thank you, George. You're still the old master, Dr. Charlie. Those old hands are priceless. Yes, they are priceless, aren't they? But believe it or not, for a man so endowed, I've been most ungrateful. Ungrateful? To whom? For what? For everything, George. For these God-given hands. For the fame and fortune they brought me. But what's much more, the opportunity to use them. But you've earned it all. You're a self-made man. A self-made man. No, George. I'm what I am only by the grace of God. Everything I have, I owe to God. For no man can really call anything his own because he's merely the steward of the things committed to him by the Lord. I object. The defendant's theological dissertation is merely his personal opinion and is irrelevant. Your Honor, the opinion my client has expressed is relevant, for it definitely illustrates Dr. Grayson's reasoning powers and mental competence. Objection overruled. Proceed, Mr. Grover. Hey, Your Honor, I kind of missed that last thing Dr. Grayson said because he was uninterrupted. Can we have it again? Mr. Reporter, can you please read back the last part of the witness testimony? Me, a self-made man? No, George. I'm what I am only by the grace of God, and everything I have, I owe to God. For no man can really call anything his own, because he is merely the steward of the things committed to him by the Lord. Proceed, Mr. Grover. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Grayson, according to some of the testimony already presented in this court, you did give various sums of money to certain people, did you not? I did. Was this before or after you decided to make this large gift to the church? Before. Now, Doctor, would you tell this court what suddenly prompted you to decide upon making such a gift to the church? I wasn't prompted suddenly. I was merely aroused by a particular sermon our minister delivered one day. He was preaching on Christian giving. Yes, my friends, Christians must give because giving is part of true worship. Our offerings are the measure of our faith and our love. My friends, I wonder how many of us have the right attitude about giving, the Christian attitude. When the scriptures say, ye are not your own, they mean exactly what those words imply. We are not our own. Our bodies, our minds, skills, personalities, all are his by right of his creation. And we are also his by right of his redemption. That is why the Apostle Paul is quick to add, Ye are not your own, for ye are bought with a price. Yes, every one of us is a purchased individual, purchased by God. And the price. Peter reminds us of the tremendous price when he tells us, 
ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Ye were bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. My friends, I sometimes ask myself, in view of the infinite power and infinite love which a gracious God has bestowed on us poor sinful mortals, what return is he getting on his investment? Surely our gratitude for the blessings which are ours should prompt us to place our total selves into the service of the Lord, returning unto him our time, our talents, and our treasures. Giving to Christ is a vital part of our living for Christ. The stewardship of the gospel is our obligation our responsibility. And if God so loved us that he gave his only son for our eternal salvation, should we not express our gratitude and return Christ's love for us by liberally supporting his program for spreading the gospel at home and abroad? Remember this. The purse always follows the heart. If we are his, and surely we are, then let us be used for his purposes. That his name may be hallowed, that his kingdom may come, that his will be done. Why, Dr. Grayson. Good afternoon, Pastor. How have you been? Very well indeed, thank you. Good. Won't you sit down? Thank you. It's good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, Pastor, I was deeply impressed by your sermon last week. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, no, no, no. I'm thanking you. <laughs> In fact, that's what brought me here. You know, before listening to your sermon, I had always thought I was practicing the principles of Christian stewardship. You have been one of our most liberal contributors, Doctor. That's just it. I've been only a contributor, not a steward. But now, I know, as you put it in your sermon, that the Lord isn't looking for only contributors. I mean, well, people peel a dollar or two from the top of their billfolds and toss it to the Lord like a tip to a waiter. Very aptly put, Doctor. And I feel that my giving has been too impersonal, more like paying taxes. I believe I know just what you mean. Sometimes we find ourselves keeping our gratitude to Christ in this pocket, and we do our giving from this pocket. No, we don't always give to the Lord because of what we have in here. Oh, we give all right, but often it's just from the purse to the church when it should be from the heart to Christ. Pastor, in my profession, that would be called a very good diagnosis. <laughs> now, what about the prescription? Early in my ministry, my mother gave me a prescription. William, she said, whatever you do in life, whatever that may be, do it as unto Christ. For me, these three words have spelled the difference between a humdrum ministry and one of real satisfaction. Somehow, I feel that if all of us, every day, could get that particular sense of doing and giving, as unto Christ. We not only give more, but we derive more joy and satisfaction from it. Pastor, I've been thinking. I want to do something as unto Christ. I'd like to make an offering of $50,000. Why? Why, doctor, I... That's wonderful, Doctor. I... 
hardly know what to say. Have you... Have you decided how you'd like your gift to be used? Well, frankly, no, I hadn't. Why don't you take a few days to think it over? Very well. Will you stop in at the house in a couple of days? We'll discuss it further. Now then, Doctor, did the Reverend Goodwin thereafter call on you at your home? He did. What transpired during that visit, Doctor? Well, on that day I was in the sunroom when my housekeeper... Doctor, Mr. Goodwin is here to see you. Oh, fine. Come in, come in, Pastor. Thank you, Doctor. I dropped in to talk further with you about that special gift to our church. Oh, good. Sit down, please. Thank you. Well, Pastor, as you suggested, I've given the matter much thought. And have you decided how your gifts should be used? Yes. Since for the last couple of years we've been talking about a new north wing for the church, I thought I'd like to see it used for that purpose. That's... that's fine, Doctor. But, uh, have you considered all the needs of the kingdom before reaching your decision? Have I overlooked something? Well, Doctor, far be it from me to tell a man of your generosity what to do with his money. But somehow, I feel that right now, there are much greater needs than a new wing for the church. What, for instance, Pastor? Have you considered the desperate need for the gospel on all of our far-flung mission fronts? Just think of the destitution, hunger, fear, anxiety, the spiritual and moral chaos in every section of the world today. And then, think of the struggle we're having to keep our missions properly manned and supported here and abroad. <sighs> Forgive me, Doctor. It's just that I know you'd want your gift to do the greatest possible good. Pastor, when you were at the seminary, they didn't give you a course in salesmanship, did they? No, no, doctor. My job isn't selling. It's just telling. I can only tell our people what the needs are. And I thank you for your guidance. You know, Pastor, Mind you, I'm not saying that the church isn't going to get that new North Wing. But I am saying that this $50,000 will go to our missions. Splendid. Splendid. And I'm sure you'll be very happy with this decision. You know, Pastor, this time, I feel that I am giving as unto Christ. So, after the pastor left, I went to my nephew's office to ask them to make out the check. Dr. Grayson, you've heard the testimony of Mary and John Biddle, the witnesses for the plaintiffs? Yes. Now, was that the same conversation referred to by Mary and John Biddle in their testimony? Yes. Your witness, Mr. Palmer. Dr. Grayson, isn't it a fact that prior to your better acquaintance with the Reverend Goodwin, your stewardship at the church left a great deal to be desired? That's very true. I could have done much more. Dr. Grayson, will you admit that except for the persuasive influence of your pastor, you never would have considered making such a large gift? If you mean by persuasive influence, his guidance towards better stewardship, then the answer is yes. Your Honor, the witness's answer is evasive. I move it be stricken from the record. Dr. Grayson, please try to answer the question yes or no, if you can. I will repeat the question. Dr. Grayson, will you admit that except for the persuasive influence of your pastor, you never would have considered making such a large gift? No. He merely opened my eyes. That's all. Dr. Grayson, can you give me any reason, any understandable reason, which actually prompted you to make such a large gift to the church in the first place? Mr. Palmer, 
There is only one reason why I wish to give that money to the church. It comes from here. I only wish you could understand my gratitude to Christ and all that he has done for me. That's all, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor. You may step down. Dr. James Brady, please. Dr. James Brady, please take the stand. Swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Dr. Brady, you are a doctor of medicine and have been practicing in this community for 20 years. Is that right? Yes. Do you know Mrs. Dalton, one of the witnesses, the lady seated over there? Very well. Mrs. Dalton's been one of my patients for many years. Doctor, do you have Mrs. Dalton's permission to acquaint the jury as to what her physical and mental state was before the so-called momentous event described in court as the death of Freddy? I object. Counsel for Defense is attempting to ridicule an important witness. Objection overruled. Proceed with your answer, Dr. Brady. Yes. The poor soul was a lonely woman whose rundown condition was mostly due to malnutrition, aggravated by an overwhelming fear complex. The last, no doubt, engendered by a life of constant poverty and insecurity. When outside of this court, did you last see Mrs. Dalton? She came to my office about three weeks ago. Doctor, I know this will never repay you for what you've done, but I wanted you to know my heart is in the right place. Well, what's happened to you, Mrs. Dalton? Why, you look like a new woman. That I am, Doctor, that I am. I never felt so good in my whole life. Maybe it's because I've been eating lately, or uh, the new clothes. Had a windfall? Well, not exactly. It's a long story. I wish it could have come some other way, but you can't imagine what it's like for me to have a few dollars. And now with these new clothes, maybe I can get a job. <laughs> and did you get a job, Mrs. Dalton? Yes, I did. And beginning next week, I intend to pay Dr. Grayson every penny of that money. I object. The intentions of the witness are totally irrelevant. Mr. Palmer, in this court's opinion, they're extremely relevant. Overruled. Proceed. And now, Mrs. Dalton, one more question. Did you ever tell Dr. Grayson just who this Freddy was? I didn't have to. I found out later that he'd known it right from the start. He understood. Your witness, Mr. Palmer. No questions. That'll be all, Mrs. Dalton. Thank you. I will now call Mr. Ben Renson. Ben Renson, please take a stand. Swear to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. I do. Mr. Renson, as a witness for the plaintiffs, you previously testified that Louis Lumpkin was responsible for your meeting Dr. Grayson. Is that right? Yeah. Now, as to Louis Lumpkin, how and when did you first meet him? Well, uh, we, we roamed together for uh, two years uh, in the big house. By the big house, you mean the state penitentiary? Uh, yeah, we served a stretch together. What is your present means of livelihood, Mr. Renson? Huh? Oh, oh, oh I, I got the magazine and candy stand in the lobby of the Wilson building. Ever been in any legitimate business before? No. This is the first break I ever got. Nobody never gave me a chance before. How much of an investment does your stand represent, Mr. Renson? One G. Uh, a grand. Uh, Louis took me over to clip the dock out of a thousand bucks. You mean to help rehabilitate you? 
Dr. Grayson advanced you $1,000 to invest in a legitimate business, is that right? That's right. But when my wife heard what me and Louie were going to pull, she made me go through with the deal and buy the stand. Better than that, the half I was going to kick back to Louie, she made me return to the dock. And are you happy and contented with what you're doing now? Are you kidding? Uh, sure, I'm happy. Thank you, Mr. Renson. Your witness, Mr. Palmer. Mr. Renson. <clears throat> What else do you sell at this so-called magazine and candy stand? Peanuts, popcorn, and comic books for kids. Oh, come now, Mr. Renson. Isn't the stand up front for some illegal enterprise? Don't you take bets on horse racing? No, sir, not mine. You must have been placing your bets someplace else. <laughs> Considering your past record, Mr. Renson, it is only natural to assume that you would turn to some illegal Your Honor, means. I object. The counsel's remarks are deliberately calculated to prejudice the jury. Your Honor, I'm merely leading up to an objective question to prove our contention that Dr. Grayson is irrational. For that matter, if I did not personally believe the defendant was crazy, why... This is outrageous, Your Honor. I move the counsel's remarks be stricken from the records on the grounds that... On second thought, I withdraw my motion. Let the remark stand. Very well, gentlemen. Proceed, Mr. Palmer. No further question. Call your next witness, Mr. Grover. Mr. Palmer, will you please take the stand? Your Honor, this is ridiculous. As attorney for the plaintiffs, I can't appear as a witness for the defense. Your Honor, in the name of justice, is it not the defense's prerogative to summon any person as a witness? I'm afraid you'll have to take the stand, Mr. Palmer. Your Honor, this is highly irregular. I'll grant it somewhat unusual. But it's not without precedent and it's perfectly legal. Mr. Clerk, swear the witness. We're going to tell the truth and nothing but the truth, I hope you've got it. I do. Mr. Palmer, you made a remark a few moments ago that in your opinion, Dr. Grayson is crazy. Now let me ask you, Mr. Palmer, you are married, you have a family? Yes. You and your wife and children are members of a church? I object, Your Honor. Any question relating to my private life is, is irrelevant. Objection overruled, Mr. Palmer. Please answer the question. I forgot the question. Are you and your family members of a church, Mr. Palmer? Yes. Do you take part in any of your church's activities? Yes. Which ones, Mr. Palmer? A number of them. Mr. Palmer, let me ask you. Have you ever contributed any money to your church? Certainly not $50,000. The amount is unimportant, Mr. Palmer. Have you ever contributed any money to your church? Yes. Regularly? Yes. Why? Why? Yes, Mr. Palmer. Why? Why? Chief, you can get your banner head ready. Dr. Charlie's gonna beat the case. No, no, the jury's still in the box. How do I know? Look, Chief, I know. And don't ask me why. 
That's the word Dr. Charlie's lawyer just won the case with. Look, you want to scoop the other rags, don't you? All right, then switch me over to Joe so I can give him this. Hello, Joe. Now get this. The Dr. Grayson case reached an unexpected dramatic climax today when... I have now instructed you on the law. Bear in mind that you and you alone are the sole judges of the facts. You may now retire and deliberate upon your verdict. Mr. Bailey, conduct the jury. Your Honor, it will not be necessary for us to retire. The jury has already arrived at a verdict. What is your verdict? We find for the defendant, Dr. Grayson. Thank you very much. <laughs> no, Doctor. We're the ones to thank you. Many thanks. I shall never forget what you taught us during this trial. Doc, you sure rung the bell. Anything else? Uh, good rewrite. Hey, listen, Newland. Even you could rewrite this into a Pulitzer Prize. Yeah, so what? through. 